let's approach the subject of what makes muscles grow beyond normal levels as a good exercise scientist might. There aren't many of those around today, so you have to kind of create your own image of a good exercise scientist. Having observed innumerable bodybuilders and strength athletes work out, the good exercise scientist concludes that there must obviously be something about the workout itself, some element or variable which can be isolated and identified as responsible for causing muscle growth stimulation. How does he find it? Where does he launch his investigation aimed at discovering the variable, the element responsible for inducing growth stimulation? The most likely place to start is by looking at one of the more readily observed attributes of the facts in reality, of the things that exist in reality, namely quantity. In this context, the exercise scientist would concern himself with the volume or number of sets being performed. Now, since people who perform no weight training have muscles of normal size, and those who perform some resistance exercise usually do grow larger muscles, perhaps growth stimulation is directly related to the volume. It's not, it's not an illogical or rational place to start an investigation. That's where I would look. That's where I looked. In order to test his hypothesis, he observes numerous individuals training over a period of time during which the volume of the exercise grows progressively greater. But something is wrong. Beyond a definite point, increased volume resulted in a complete lack of progress and any further increase in volume, the subjects inevitably, invariably, in every case, grew weaker and suffered overuse atrophy. So, what may have initially appeared obvious now is not so obvious. The growth stimulus cannot be directly related to the quantity of the exercise effort or the training subjects would have experienced best results with the highest possible volume. While the notion that more is better is attractive in its simplicity, it just doesn't work. Let's look for a moment, in fact, at the implicit logic in that idea. More is better audience means literally that. More is better means more is better. There's a built-in guarantee. If 20 sets are good, i.e. yield satisfactory results, then 40 sets would be even better and 80 better still, and 120 sets better still, and so on into infinity. And that's where we find ourselves. There it is, the obvious tenuity, the monumental absurdity of the volume argument, all wrapped up in a singular childlike notion that more is better. It is erroneous, illogical, non-productive, and even counterproductive. Look about you. Everyone who engages in exercise or athletic training of any sorts performs a certain volume of work. If volume was the key in and of itself, the stimulus responsible for triggering growth, those who perform the most exercise, the greatest volume, such as marathon runners, would have the largest muscles. It's also interesting and illuminating to note here that the majority who advocate the volume approach have little or nothing to say at least not consistently as part of a valid non-contradictory theory, about what the actual stimulus is responsible for triggering the body's growth mechanism into motion. At least I'm not aware of it, or any of you. What do the volume people claim is the stimulus? I guess implicitly they, it's the volume, but they never give you any explanation as to why that is or what the mechanism is. And that's one of the reasons I refer to theirs as the blind, non-theoretical volume approach. It's literally blind. Yes, anyone and everyone who exercises, aerobically, anaerobically, or athletically, has to perform some volume of exercise. But it may be any volume. Parenthetically here, later I will logically demonstrate that the issue of volume in high-intensity anaerobic weight resistance exercise is a negative factor, period. The vast majority who exercise typically do so for one hour. If you were to go and do a survey throughout the 
the gyms in the world, you would find that the average trainee trains for an hour. Why? Because it's a, it's a traditional or cultural convenience. We get paid by the hour. We go to the psychiatrist by the hour. Therefore, it's only logical, right? Train for an hour. Of course, I'm being facetious. Yes, the vast majority train for an hour. Yet such doesn't in, in invariably result in the same or similar or any muscle increase. So where do we now turn to discover the variable and exercise responsible for stimulating growth? Since it is not the quantity or volume of effort, there is but one place left to go, the quality or intensity of the effort. The best way to explain a highly abstract principle like intensity is to go to a concrete example in perceptual reality. Let's assume hypothetically that every one of you here today is capable of curling a 100 pound barbell for a maximum of 10 reps to failure. <clears throat> Obviously, audience, the first rep of that set would be the easiest. Or to be more technically precise, we would say the first rep requires the least intensity of effort. The first rep does fatigue you a little bit, however. That's why the second rep is always a little bit harder. Whereas the first rep may require on the order of 8 or 10% intensity of effort, the second rep you see may require 15 or 20% intensity of effort. The second rep fatigues you even further, of course, and that's why the third rep is harder still requiring a more intense effort than did the second. Without belaboring the issue, you know that's how it goes with each successive rep of the set. Each one becomes harder to complete, requiring a more intense effort than did the preceding. Until finally we get to the last possible rep in this hypothetical case, again, a set of barbell curls to failure at 10 reps with 100 pounds. The last rep would be the only one where we say it requires literally 100% intensity of effort. You're gritting your teeth, you're shaking all over, and you barely get the bar to the top. Now I ask you, which repetition of that set is more likely to stimulate an increase in strength and muscular size? The first rep, which is the least intense, or the last rep, the hardest one? the only rep requiring 100% intensity of effort. Of course, the last one. I have had some people say the first. They were just nervous and just lost their focus entirely. Another question. If you were, if you were actually able to curl a 100-pound barbell for a maximum of 10 reps to failure, now you would never do this, but again, hypothetically here, and for some weird reason, you put the bar right back down at that point, never attempting a second, third, fourth, or fifth rep, and so on, would you ever grow? No. Because the intensity of the stress on the body's physiology would not be sufficiently threatening to warrant an adaptive response. In this case, a strength and size increase. Just like you would never obtain a suntan, no matter how long you sat in front of a 100-watt light bulb rubbing phosphagene suntan lotion all over you. Nature requires fundamentally, first of all, the presence of a high-intensity sunlight stress. Only then does the suntan lotion issue become important. Executing that last, almost impossible rep causes the body to dip into what's called its reserve ability. And since your body only has a small amount of reserve to draw upon before depletion occurs, the body protects itself from future assaults on its reserves by enlarging upon its existing ability through the compensatory buildup of more muscle mass. Only high intensity training can force the body to resort to its reserve ability sufficiently to stimulate an adaptive response in the form of a muscle mass increase. Repeating tasks that are well within your existing capacity do absolutely nothing to stimulate growth. Ending a set before failure just because an arbitrary number of reps have been completed will do nothing to stimulate an increase or induce growth. Carrying a set to a point where you are forced to utilize 
100% of your momentary muscular, muscular ability is the single most important factor for increasing strength and size. Working to a point of momentary muscular failure where another rep is impossible despite your greatest effort ensures that you pass through the breakover point or that point in the set below which growth is not stimulated and above which you grow, go, growth is stimulated. Even the detractors of high intensity training theory would be forced to admit that the last rep of a set to failure is more productive than the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. Thus, without realizing it, they have embraced the first principle of the theory. Although in denying any validity to high intensity training theory at all, as they do, of course they are denying the entire theory, including the principle of intensity, which is tantamount to saying that the first rep of a set is just as likely to stimulate growth as is the last. But then what would you expect from the mystics of muscle? <laughs>